Hey everyone, I'm Nick, and this is Bits of Architecture. So in this episode of the series, we're going to be talking about our pipelined RISC-V architecture. So in the previous videos, we have talked a lot about pipelining, right? So we talked about what pipelining is and some of the difficulties that we run into related to these things called hazards. So as a brief refresher on what pipelining is and you know why we're so keen on implementing it, uh, pipelining is this idea that we can break up our execution um, of our instructions into individual stages. So unlike our single cycle processors where we execute an entire instruction um, in a single cycle, with our pipeline or multi-cycle processors, we're executing uh, one stage of our pipeline for an instruction every single cycle. And because we've broken this up into stages, we can overlap the execution of multiple instructions, right? So we can get better utilization out of these hardware structures. So while one instruction is doing, say, a write back to the register file, another instruction could be accessing memory, another could be uh, doing something with the ALU, so in the execute stage, another could be decoding an instruction, and another could be uh, you know, actually fetching an instruction right, from instruction memory. So we can get all of this parallelism out of our instructions, this overlap, and see a pretty good performance improvement. Now, how exactly uh, do we implement this pipeline processor, right? What does our high-level architecture diagram look like? Well, it looks something like this, right? Something that's quite similar to what we had uh, seen in the past for our single cycle implementation. The only real major difference between our single cycle implementation and this one is these, uh, these, these structures that are coming down dividing these different stages here. So dividing instruction fetch and decode, dividing uh, decode and execute, dividing execute in our memory stage, and our memory stage in our write back stage. And these things um, we're gonna call pipeline registers, right? Now, why exactly do we need these extra structures, right? These pipeline registers? Well, recall the main difference between pipelining and our single cycle processor. With our single cycle processor, um, an instruction has access to all of the hardware resources um, in a given cycle, right? Um, so it can access instruction memory, read the registers, um, do some sort of execution, uh, maybe do something with the data, uh, the, the data memory, so maybe a read or a write, um, and then of course it can write back to the register file, right? All within the same cycle. Uh, we no longer have that with our multi-cycle implementation. Uh, an instruction is only allowed to work within a single stage of our pipeline at any given moment, right? So by the time we're in the execute stage um, of, of an instruction, right, uh, that instruction no longer has access to things from the uh, decode stage, right? So, um, you know, say the values we read out of a register file in the decode stage have to be saved somewhere um, for use in the next stage, right? So for example, if we had an R-type instruction doing, say, an add, so in the decode stage, that instruction would read up the two registers that it wants to operate on, and it would save them in this pipeline register, right? That way in the next cycle, it could then use those values from the pipeline register in the execute stage, while another instruction, say I2, reads out the registers that it wants to use, right, out of the register file, right? So we need these pipeline registers in order to uh, checkpoint the state for our instructions um, as it moves through the pipeline. So these pipeline registers just keep track of everything that an instruction needs as it goes through the pipeline. So one thing that's kind of omitted from this diagram and is something that we'll, we'll end up doing from time to time in order to uh, simplify this diagram so we can look at it and understand it a bit easier um, is uh, we're, we're missing the control lines from this diagram. So how are these different uh, hardware units controlled? Well, they're still controlled with the same kind of control lines that we had in the past. So our register file still has this register write um, flag. Um, our multiplexers still have these flags for say, selecting an ALU source, whether that's an immediate value um, or that's coming from you know, the, a register. Our data memory has our mem write and our mem read. Um, we have, say, a branch flag, so whether or not this is a branch instruction. So all of these flags still exist. But recall, we have a bit more challenging of an issue now, right? So just like our state, like, you know, the values from a register need to be saved in a pipeline register, the same is true for our control signals, right? Um, you know, each instruction might have a slightly different set of control signals um, to, um, 
you know, orchestrate these different hardware structures, right? So the control signals that, you know, a, a load or a store instruction needs is going to be different than, say, an R-type instruction, right? Um, for something like a, a, a store, right, we have to set this mem write uh, signal. But for a, you know, just to add, uh, we don't need to set mem write at all, right? We don't care about the memory stage. So we also need to do uh, some checkpointing related to these control signals as an instruction moves through the pipeline. So that's also what our pipeline registers are going to do. They're going to help us keep track of these control signals. So, you know, recall as we went through with our single cycle processor, we have a control unit that takes in our instruction, right, or our opcode, and it's going to generate control signals based upon what operation that we're going to perform. And it'll send these different control signals, it'll save them rather, inside of our pipeline registers so that they can be used in the stage that they're needed, right? So we have two signals that are needed in the write back stage, three signals needed in the memory stage, and two signals needed in the execute stage. So if we go ahead and uh, go back to our original diagram, right, we can even see those signals. So, um, you know, after, uh, you know, decode here, where we're decoding our instruction and setting our control signals, um, inside of the execute stage, we have our two signals we need, which is for a multiplexer, our ALU source, as well as our ALU op control signal that helps us control what operation ALU is going to perform. So there's our con two control signals for execute. Inside of uh, our memory stage, we have three signals, right? So we have mem read and mem write, so controlling whether we're doing a read or a write. And then we also have a branch signal here uh, that's, that, you know, is there to select our next program counter value. Um, we're not going to count this, uh, this zero uh, control signals coming out of our ALU here because that's not coming out of the control unit. But it is another control signal that we'll save in the pipeline register. But this one's not uh, coming from our control unit back in the decode stage. And then in our write back stage, right, we have two control signals. One selecting our mem to reg source. So what are we saving to a register file? Something from data memory. Um, or are we saving something from our ALU that we calculated, right? So we're selecting between those two. And then, of course, um, the other signal that we have in our write-back stage is our register write signal. So whether or not we're going to write to the register file, right? Uh, so remember, not every instruction writes to the register file. A branch, if equal, doesn't write to the register file. Um, neither does a store instruction. That doesn't write to the register file. Um, okay, so those are the signals that we need to keep track of here, right, in these pipeline control registers. So let's kind of put it all together, right, so we can put everything into one diagram, uh, even though for the most cases we'll omit some of these control signals so we can focus on maybe some of the more uh, interesting hardware structures that we're uh, looking at at a given moment. So this, this is roughly what it will look like, and to simplify it somewhat, instead of doing all seven control signals, I've just grouped uh, write back, mem, and execute signals into just a single line here, or rather one for each, right, for simplicity. So you can see in the decode stage, right, we get our instruction, our opcode, we set our control signals, and those get saved inside of a pipeline register. Then when they're needed, so in the next stage in execute, when our execute signals are needed, those are piped down into the uh, hardware structures, so into our multiplexer into our, and our ALU control unit. Then in the memory stage, we get our memory signals for our branch, our mem write, and our mem read. And then in the write back stage, we get our signals for our multiplexer and for our, um, our register write here for our register file. So whether or not we're going to be writing to the register file. Okay, so that's going to be the basics of our RISC-V pipelined architecture. So in many ways, it's similar to our, um, our single cycle implementation, right? Many of our structures are exactly the same, like our, our multiplexers, our program counters, our memory, our registers, our ALUs, etc. The main difference is that we now have these pipeline registers, though, to keep our checkpointed state um, as an instruction goes through um, these different pipeline stages. In later videos, we'll talk about how we handle some of the other interesting details like forwarding and bypassing inside of this architecture as well. But that's going to go ahead and do it for this time. As always, I'm Nick, and I hope you have a nice day.